Why would someone meet Jesus in the darkness of night? That's what we're going to talk about today in John 3. This next scene that we're going to talk about in John 3 was one of my favorites inside of the TV show, The Chosen. This buildup of Nicodemus. We don't hear a lot about Nicodemus in general in the scriptures. So this is something that I think was given a story around it. But it makes some sense that Israel being a small place, Jerusalem being a small place, and Nicodemus being one of the Sanhedrin, one of it says a ruler of the Jews, the interest in him. You can tell he comes to Jesus, not like some of the others come to Jesus with sarcasm or baloney exercises in scripture, but instead he comes to Jesus with honest questions. But guess what? He does so in the middle of the night. He didn't want to see Jesus in broad daylight, I think. What are people going to say? What are they going to treat him like if they see he is coming to Jesus where everyone can see it? So he has questions, and these are honest questions. And again, it wasn't a trick. I think Jesus is perfectly happy answering our questions, answering when we're being stupid. Even the stupid questions of John and James of who's going to sit at the left and who's going to be at the right it might be frustrating, but he answers honest questions. It's, this is not a trap. So he wants to know, if Jesus is from God, how are you doing all these things unless you're from God? And Jesus gives him a puzzling question. This is ESV. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, well, how can anyone be born when they're old or go back into their mother's womb again? That doesn't make any sense. I don't think Nicodemus believes that's what Jesus is inferring. I think he gets this is the higher principle. But Jesus comes back. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. It goes into that what flesh is flesh and what spirit is spirit. And then I thought the next part was even more confusing because he says, don't marvel at the fact I told you you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. And everyone hears a sound, right? The wind blows, we hear the sound of it. We don't know where it comes from or where it goes. We don't know the source of it or its purpose. But that's what it's like to be born of the spirit. You hear the word of God. And you can hear, not where it's coming from and not where it's going, but you can hear your part of it. Nicodemus is like, well, how can that be? <laughs> now I'm even more confused. Jesus responds, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we've seen. You do not receive our testimony. You're not hearing what we're saying. You're not hearing the message I'm giving to people. And the we he's talking about is probably him. John the Baptist, maybe even the prophets of old, this message has been going out. These earthly things that have to happen, if you're not hearing them, if you're not understanding them, how are you ever going to understand these heavenly things, these more spiritual things that are at a higher level? And then invokes this story of Moses, where he took a snake and put its head on a spike and lifted it up to save the people of Israel who had been bitten because of their sins. Jesus is going to be lifted up as well on a stick so that everyone can have eternal life. He is going to be that redemption for whoever believes in him. This whole conversation is deep because he is talking to a learned man, someone who understands the Bible. When he heard that story of Moses, he knew that this was a redemption movement, that Moses saved people through this action. And now Jesus is going to Take that same action and save the people too. But the snake bite is our sins and the sins of everyone. And what we're going to be saved of is death. Jesus is going to save everyone who looks to him. The important part of it is that this new birth, this new heart, this being born of water and a spirit is something that happens here. We don't go into heaven and then get reborn into the spirit, learn about the spirit of God, accept the spirit of God. Stop rejecting the Spirit of God. That happens here through baptism, through faith, through listening with open ears to the things that Jesus is trying to say to us. I think Jesus is asking him, are you ready to learn this next level of things? Are you ready to do what it takes 
so that you can move on away from these earthly things. I think that was part of the problem with the Pharisees and and the Sanhedrin is they were so detailed about law and instead not talking about the inside spirit. We saw that in other gospels. You care about the cup being washed, but you don't care about your souls. We're finding out, is Nicodemus that guy or is Nicodemus the guy who wants to go on and learn more to be born of water, but spirit, getting that understanding of God. And I don't think it's difficult. Again, Jesus talks to people where they're at. He's talking to an educated man who understands the core of the Jewish faith and where it has been for a really long time. This is a faith going on for thousands of years. And if it gets wrong, half a degree every decade, it's going to be very off by the time you get to the point of Jesus. They were let back in the land from the Babylonian exile without repenting. They are still off course right now. Criminal on the cross next to Jesus, we found out at the end of Luke. Jesus says, you're going to be with me in heaven tomorrow. Nothing happened. He wasn't baptized. He didn't have to perform any special actions. He also probably never got some formal education, but it was that belief. He was suddenly born of the Spirit because of what happened in his soul, not because of what happened in his actions, his words, his deed. The Holy Spirit and Jesus saved him, not his actions, but the actions of Jesus, the actions of God, his redemption plan. That's how we're saved and not by our own works or efforts. I think that concept to the temple structure would have been the hardest of all. We can't control it. My own closest friends are control freaks. They love controlling everything. Structure of the temple has been going on for hundreds of years trying to nail this down. Get it so they're doing exactly the right thing, exactly the right way, and then living their lives otherwise so they're enjoying themselves. They want control. Boy, isn't that confusing. And they're not going to be satisfied by this because they have no control. This is a gift from God. And what the People Bible commentary said is the promise belongs to everyone. No one who believes is excluded. And the promises to each of us that God knows our name, knows who we are. And that invitation and that promise goes out to all of us, whether you're educated like Nicodemus and a leader, or you're a nobody on the cross next to Jesus, or you're just us. Now comes the discussion of the most beloved chapter, I think, of all the Bible. Everyone loves this chapter because they can remember it. Many people have this memorized. I did Small Steps with God podcast, episode 39 and 40, from Max Lucado's book, just talking about this passage. You'll know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whomever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. It goes on to say that if you believe in him, you're not condemned. But whoever doesn't believe in him, you're already condemned. It's already happening. It's not something you have to wait for the threshing floor, this reaping of the weeds and the wheat. You're already condemned here on earth because you don't believe. God makes promises to his believers that are there for us when we believe in Jesus. But when we don't, it's already bad for us. It's already going badly for us. We are just sheep left to the wolves. We have nothing to protect us against the bad things of this world like that. Of course, situations change. People come into faith later on. This isn't a permanent thing. People who are at risk of what's going on in this world are those who don't believe. This judgment, it says, the light has come into the world, but people love the darkness and not the light. It's not even that we're hiding our light under a bushel basket. It's not that we're not shining our light and sharing it with other people. We don't even love the light. We'd rather be in the dark. We'd rather be in the place of evil. We'd rather do wicked things because the wicked things, it says, hates the light. And we learned in the first chapter of John, Jesus is the light of the world, the light that has been there ever since the beginning. The reason wickedness and people hate the light 
is because what you're doing gets exposed. There was one part in the other Gospels where Jesus says, everything that you think is unknown will become known. It gets exposed. It gets put out there in the open. Here's a man coming in through darkness to talk to Jesus. He doesn't want anyone to see it. But we should love the light and expose everything bad. Whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that may be seen clearly that his works have been carried out in God. That's what we should be doing. I mean, this right here, I think, says it all. And that's, like I said, John formulates his gospel to where you just get it all, where you suddenly realize what it is we should be doing and saying. We should be following the ways of God because the people who aren't deny God are grabbing into the light. They don't want to be seen for what they're doing. They don't want anyone to know what they're doing. And in the end, people don't hate Jesus because of the things he said or even the things that he did. They hate them because he calls everyone into account for what we do here on earth. People don't want the light exposing what they do, what they want to do, what they think it's fun to do. He opposes wickedness and everyone hates him for it. It says here that the love that is used in this chapter is called agape, which is not just um, a light kind of love, like a brotherly love. This is a deep feeling love. It's Someone says it's purposeful. It's active. It's not just, oh, I like you. You know, you've seen that where people go, oh, I love you, and they don't mean it. It's not the kind of love this is. This is a deep, soul-gripping love. But the world is trapped in sin, and we are slaves to sin. And Jesus is saying, come here to the light. I'll take you away from this. I'll take you away from that condemnation. People think that God likes to condemn people or has this narrow path so that people get condemned. Jesus is begging people, come out of the darkness. You are already condemned because you're already turned over to wickedness. Come to me. I will save you. And it's an invitation to everybody. Wow. John the Baptist uh, makes a reappearance in the scripture here. Jesus' disciples were baptizing people. We find out in a few chapters that it was actually his disciples doing so. But they're continuing on the work of John, that being born of water, being born of spirit. Then we find out that John was baptizing near Salim, and the water, it says, was plentiful there, and people were coming. This was before John was put in prison. And some of the disciples of John, remember, he had many disciples, and some of which held together for 200 years after his death, about this purification. You know, what is it that you are doing in this baptism? And John answers, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given from heaven. This is not my doing. This is not earth's doing. This isn't the water doing. This is the doing from God himself in heaven. You bear witness to me and the things I've said, but I'm not the Christ. I'm the person who has been sent before him to make wave the straight, to cry out in the desert, to announce his coming. He is announcing Jesus. The one who is friend of the bridegroom, that's John, stands here and hears him, rejoices at the, at the bridegroom's voice. The joy is mine because I know what is about to come. I'm the friend of the bridegroom. I'm excited for my friends, you know, kind of thing. And it says that he, meaning Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all of us. But here on earth belongs to earth. I'm from earth. I speak of earthly ways. But the one who's coming from heaven is going to, it says, bear witness, is going to tell you what he has seen and heard. And no one yet has received his testimony. But whoever does and sets his seal to this, that God is true. God has sent these words, and he, it says he gives his spirit without measure. Like, you got your portion of spirit, and now someone else is going to get, there is no limits to this portion of the spirit. It is unlimited, and that's where you want to set. You're listening to God's testimony. You want to know the Father loves Jesus. All things were given into his hands. And whoever believes in his son has eternal life. And whoever doesn't obey 
the Son, Jesus, shall not see life, but wrath of God remains on him. This is a good thing to hear, I think, because, again, we know that God is perfect mercy and perfect justice, that there had to be a price paid for sin. We see terrible things happen to people in this world, and we go, isn't there justice? Where's the justice for these people who have been hurt, murdered, these horrible things? We ask for justice, but we also ask for mercy. We are at the throat of evil. Evil surrounds us. We are in this darkness. We love the darkness. I mean, how many people enjoy their sins, take pride in their sins, hope that their sins lead them to a fun and exciting life? It's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to rebuke the darkness, come away from our sins, and come towards him. He's not doing it for his good. He's doing it for our good, and he wants us to know the best thing we can do is come to him, believe in him, and accept the gifts of the Holy Spirit of eternal life that God gives us. And that ends John 3. Boy, again, what am I not going to meditate about this week? But what I want to meditate about are there are things that I seek from Jesus in the dark that I don't feel comfortable being out in the light with aspects of my faith. I want to be uh, in the light, in the daytime, follower of Jesus. I want to be exposed to the world so the world can see what God has done. What I'm going to pray about is that he gives me that bold spirit so that I can do my things in the light and be bold in my faith in Christ and not cling to the dark, not do things in the darkness. And what I'm going to share with other people is this idea that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that we may believe and be saved. That's what we should share with everybody. That's why that dude back in the football game days would just sit there at the right ticket spot holding up a John 316 sign. Right there, it's the whole essence of everything we should know. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe and tell people about this podcast. I would love to eventually build a whole community around this. It is still a fairly young podcast, but if we can get biblical discussions going, I would love to see that.